Hello, crime historians, and welcome back to another episode of a crime story podcast. I'm your host, Kaylin Lois, and I am a international relations graduate student also studying international law, who is originally from the United States, but moved to Paris, France in 2018. When I moved to France, I started hearing all of these insane crime stories and cases that helped define crime culture in different countries. So I researched them and created this podcast to tell you all about it. This is episode 19 of a crime story, Brazil's infocide case of Isabella Nordani. And warning, today's episode contains violence against children. Listener discretion is advised. Today is an incredibly special episode because I had one of my listeners suggest this case to me. Then she helped research and write this actual episode with me. I want to give a huge shout out to Alini who commented on a Crime Story Podcast YouTube video about my last Brazilian case covered on episode 4 about Suzanne von Richthofen. We just started conversing about our shared hobby of following and researching crime stories. Alini is an expat like me, though she is living in the United States and is originally from Brazil. I can't thank her enough. From translating sources to just compiling information, and translating can sometimes be very hard. I love how podcasts create a community for us crime historians, murderinos, crime junkies. And this was honestly one of the primary goals of my podcast, A Crime Story, so I'm so happy that it's coming true. Today's case takes place in Brazil, which, unlike the United States system, operates on the civil law system, meaning that cases turn on whether a codified law is broken or not. The Federative Republic of Brazil has the largest geographic area in both South and Latin America, with a population of just over 211 million people. To this day, Portuguese, not Spanish, is spoken in Brazil because of the 1494 Treaty of Torsalis that gave Portugal the right to colonize Brazil. Known as a melting pot of different cultures and ethnicities, the World Bank classifies Brazil as an upper-middle-income economy, but Brazil still remains classified as a developing country. Brazil's judiciary is a multifaceted system that operates on state and federal laws, much like, much like the United States judicial system. Primarily based on civil law tradition, it divides cases into different jurisdictions, including labor, electoral, military, constitutional, and non constitutional. It also includes three instances of pill, which cases are able to advance from a first level court all the way to the Supreme Federal Court or the Superior Court of Justice. This exists in a similar fashion to municipal, state, and federal court systems and appeals in the judicial system of the United States. In most civil law systems, juries are only brought in on especially heinous crimes. In Brazil, jury trials only exist in respect to willful crimes against life, namely homicide, abortion, encouragement or assistance to commit suicide, infocide, genocide, and attempts to commit these such crimes. The crime story today is extremely popular in Brazil with a survey suggesting that 98% of Brazilians know about this case. The case captured the attention of the country, much like how the Casey Anthony case captured the attention of Americans. Infanticide, or murder of a child, captures the attention of the public because most people can't imagine a more heinous crime. The people of Brazil wanted justice for the victim, little Isabella. A Brazilian psychologist explained that Brazil became so fascinated with this case because of Brazil's passion for soap operas and shows like Big Brother that fuel the public's interest in drama and in this case, which spoke to their own fears and fantasies. In a reality show, there are all the ingredients to shake up an inner being. Brazilian culture professor Caldas explained that Brazil used to treat crime like they do in Europe, but now has moved to the United States model. There is a lot of sensationalism around crime like America today. 
when a memorial was held in Sao Paulo, Brazil, shortly after the murder of Isabella, 18,000 Brazilians attended. <laughs> Our crime story today has many characters, the main one being Isabella de Oliveira Nodani, a five-year-old child who, in 2008, lived in São Paulo, Brazil. Born in 2002 to father Alexander Alves Nordani and mother Ana Carolina Guna de Oliveira, Isabella's parents had dated for about three years. Isabella's mother discovered her pregnancy at age 17 and chose to stay at her parents' home because Alexander had just started law school. Eleven months after the birth of Isabella, her parents broke up due to honest suspicions of Alexander's infidelity. Well, these suspicions turned out to be true, as Alexander cheated on Anna with a fellow law student named Anna Carolina Jabota. The two eventually got married and had two sons together. By the beginning of 2008, Anna Oliveira and Alexander had established a custody agreement for their five-year-old as Alexander Nordani and his wife would have Isabella over from Friday to Sunday night twice a month. Sources claim that this wasn't the best co-parenting relationship between the three of them because Anna Carolina had major jealousy issues. She would only talk to Isabella's mother about Isabella opposed to the father and the mother talking to each other about their daughter. Isabella's mom did not want Isabella spending time with Anna Carolina unless Alexander was at the home with their daughter. Some allege that Isabella told her mother that she did not want to return to her dad's home after spending the weekend with him, and she would become visibly upset before and after her visits with her father. On the weekend of March 29th, 2008, Alexander had custody of Isabella for the weekend. Alexander lived with his wife and two sons on the sixth floor at the Edificio London building on Rua Santa Lestadio street in San Paolo. Now, this wasn't a bad or area or a slum, but just instead a simple middle-class apartment condo building with supposedly a simple middle-class family living inside. Around 11.30 or 11.45 p.m. that night, Isabella accidentally fell from the sixth floor onto the apartment lawn in the front of the building. Now, most homes in Brazil have screens on their windows, like we do in my native Texas, which is mainly used to keep bugs out when you have the window open. Yes, these screens can be removed, but it require either a bit of force or some tools. And personally, I don't think a five, almost six-year-old just playing around at night close to midnight could first open a window, then pop out the screen and jump to the ground below. It's just not feasible or probable to me. A call came into the police station that night, telling the dispatcher that a theft had occurred and a girl was thrown out from one of the floors of a building. Found unconscious and suffering from cardiac arrest. Found unconscious and suffering from cardiac arrest on the front garden of the apartment when police arrive. Isabella laid on the ground with her father, neighbors, and employees of the apartment building by her side. When the first responders asked Isabella's father and stepmother what happened, the couple claimed that the assailant entered the house and threw Isabella from the sixth floor window. The two did not call the police after Isabella was, quote, thrown out of the building around 11.30 to 11.45 p.m. The couple called the police closer to the morning, and they did not know who committed the supposed robbery or who pushed Isabella out of a window. Medical personnel tried to resuscitate Isabella for 34 minutes, but they were ultimately unsuccessful. Isabella died on her way to the hospital, only being a month away from her sixth birthday. After Isabella was officially pronounced dead, Alexander Nordani and Anna Carolina Jabota were taken to the police station for questioning. Alexander told the police that all, including him, his wife, daughter Isabella, and two sons had spent the evening at his in-law's house. 
They returned back to the condo around 11.30 p.m., which was late. So late that Isabel had fallen asleep in the car. Therefore, he carried Isabella's sleeping body up the stairs and put her in her bedroom. Then he locked the apartment door and went back to the garage to help his wife up with their two other children. And then when he returned to the apartment, he saw the front door was open, the window protective screen was broken, and his daughter lying on the front lawn. Which, first, this is just absolutely terrifying, but it also leaves an exceedingly small window for a burglar slash murderer to come in and complete their supposed task. While being questioned by the police, Alexander and, and Anna Carolina gave 23 names, among them employees and acquaintances who could have been possible suspects. Police questioned all of these 23 names, but none of the people went to the front of the line as a suspect. Police also dismissed the theory mentioned earlier that Isabella cut the screen herself and jumped, as a five-year-old could not simply cut the screen. Police officially ruled the case as homicide. Alexander and Anna Carolina quickly emerged as suspects due to their inconsistent stories and physical evidence. No evidence existed of a break-in, and in fact, Alexander said that he locked the doors. More significant, the police found drops of, of Isabella's blood at the entrance of the room. So if she died by falling out of a window, how does this make sense? Furthermore, police found the broken screen in Isabella's half-brother's room and not Isabella's room, meaning that when Alexander supposedly carried Isabella up the stairs, he didn't put his daughter in her own bed, but in her brother's. It also appeared that some kitchen utensils might have been used to cut the screen window. Alexander and Anna Carolina's story seemed odd as well. They did not ask about Isabella at any time of their police questioning. Now, I understand that everyone reacts to grief and to stress differently, but your five-year-old daughter just died and you don't even ask basic questions about her well-being? It does not just jive and already knowing the answers just seems more plausible of an explanation for not asking. Inconsistencies in the couple's testimony began from the get-go. The couple's version proved untrue by their neighbor's testimony as well as phone records. Police discovered that the couple constantly fought in front of their children and the main cause of these fights? Anna Carolina's jealousy and belief that Isabella's presence threatened her marriage. Anna lived in constant competition with Isabella for Alexander's attention and affection. When the medical examiner issued the autopsy report, he noted that Isabella's bodily injuries were not consistent with the fall alone, and in fact happened before the fall. Now, the details that I'm about to explain are very difficult to explain and to listen to, so I don't blame you if you want to skip a couple minutes ahead of this podcast, as we're going to discuss the manner of Isabella's body. Police forensics concluded that someone beat and asphyxiated Isabella inside the apartment before throwing her out of the sixth floor window. A report from the Criminalistics Institute states that Isabella was strangled for three Three minutes inside of the apartment, causing respiratory arrest. The report concludes that the bruises on the girl's necks were compatible with the hands of her stepmother, Anna Carolina. Afterwards, someone threw Isabella from the sixth floor condo window, causing polytrauma and injuries to the internal organs. Forensics also found that traces of the window screen on Alexander's clothes and that a footprint on the bed matched Alexander. Isabella had several bruises on the inside of her mouth, an indication that her mouth was covered so she wouldn't scream. Isabella also had a wound on her forehead, and according to forensics, a blunt object caused the trauma, probably a tetrarchy, or I know it as a fob, which is very common for extra security in apartments. The coroner responsible for the case reported that the girl could have died even if she had not been thrown out of the window due to the brutal violence that she had suffered. The medical examiner stated that someone threw Isabella out of the window 12 minutes after the family's arrival to the apartment. Although circumstantial evidence suggests that Isabella's death occurred from the fall, her injuries show otherwise. 
only her wrists were broken, in addition to the fact that she was still alive, albeit barely, when discovered. Neighbors report that they heard screams from a child saying, Stop, Daddy! Some people believe that it was from Isabella, but forensics conclude that it could have come from Is one of Isabella's younger brothers, since the asphyxiation likely rendered her unconscious and near death. The police also questioned Isabella's biological mother, Ana Oliveira, and based on her testimony, the police request a temporary arrest of Isabella's father and stepmother not even 24 hours after the murder. Authorities officially arrest and indict the couple on the charge of murder on April 18, 2008. Both claimed their innocence. <laughs> The prosecutor, Francisco Cimbarnelli, charged a couple with intentional murder, triple qualified. This means that there exists an intention to kill by cruel means. The victim has an inability to defend themselves, and there is another hidden crime. In addition to homicide, the couple also faced procedural fraud for tampering with evidence after the fact and altering the crime scene. According to the prosecutor, bloodstains in the apartment and washed clothes belonging to Alexander provided strong evidence that the accused manipulated the crime scene. The best equivalent I could find to these charges in the United States system would be capital murder with special circumstances, which means capital murder means that you commit first degree murder while committing another felony, in this case being the extremity in nature and child abuse slash battery. Now the child abuse, the battery, as well as the tampering with evidence charge certainly deserves the fullest possible charge. While awaiting trial, Alexander's father, Antonio Nordani, who was a lawyer, oversaw the couple's defense and public image. In several interviews with Brazilian news programs, Antonio Nordani stated that anyone could have entered the building and accessed the apartment. But remember, the forensic police showed that no sign of a break-in at the apartment or even at the door existed. Anna Carolina stated that a few days before the murder, she had lost the keys to the apartment. And this could explain why forensics didn't find any sign of a break-in. To believe this story, one has to believe that she lost the keys, a random stranger found the keys, found the apartment that the keys went to, killed a five-year-old child while not harming or taking anything else from the apartment. Like, yeah, right, this just doesn't seem feasible or even probable. While awaiting trial, the stepmother had some problems in jail as her fellow inmates did not treat her very nice. On Mother's Day, they left a note for her in the prison yard stating, quote, tribute to Isabella on this Mother's Day, damn murderer, end quote. Authorities moved her to another prison for her protection and held her in solitary confinement at that prison for her protection. Authorities treated Alexander Nordani differently and held him in a different penitentiary regime because he had a university degree. And he was also held in solitary confinement for his protection. Isabella's mother remained mostly reclusive during the days leading up to the trial, mostly attending mass, other religious celebrations, and memorials in the name of her Isabella. The Brazilian press hounded her, and she gave one significant interview to an important Brazilian TV program. She stated that the statements of Alexander and his wife were not at all convincing. She said she talked very little with Isabella's father in order to gain justice for Isabella and to serve as a prosecution witness. Alexander and Anna Carolina went on trial on March 22, 2010, almost two years to the day of Isabella's death. The first day of the trial, Anna Carolina testified for three hours, presenting a very emotional story where she criticized the police and said that the charges against her were totally false. Alexander Nordani took a different approach in his testimony by attacking the conduct of the civil police during the investigations into the murder. Alexander said that the police coerced him and blamed him for the crime. He said that the police deputy called him a cold psychopath and made him so angry during this police questioning that he kicked the trash can in the police station room and hit a table. This aspect of the testimony seems like a very bad choice to me and 
that his lawyer allowed him to testify this way because it shows me that Alexander Nordani had a lot of pride as well as a temper, which can both be a motive for murder. One of the testimonies for the prosecutor's argument stated that a witness saw fights between Alexander and Anna Carolina caused by Anna Carolina's jealousy. The female witness told the judge that she witnessed at least one attempt where Anna Carolina attacked her husband in front of Alexander's mother. The witness said that she told Isabella's grandmother that she didn't want Isabella to go to the couple's apartment with Anna Carolina and that she worried for Isabella's safety. In the end, the jury found the couple both guilty and the judge sentenced Alexander to 31 years, one month, and 10 days in prison, and Anna Carolina to 26 years and 8 months with the right to parole, and they can apply to reduce the sentence. The jury consisted of four women and three men and understood that the defendants committed triple qualified homicide for using cruel means, asphyxiation, not defending the victim who was unconscious while she was thrown through a window and having committed a crime which was to cover up another crime. The judge increased Alexander's sentence by one six because he committed the crime against his own daughter for failing to act as a reasonable father. The aggravating factor of the crime against someone under the age of 14 added to their sentence as did the conviction for procedural fraud. They both received an additional eight months and 48 days as well as a fine for changing the crime scene in order to cheat the authorities. When reading the sentence, Alexander showed little to no emotion and Anna Carolina cried. Isabella's maternal family, on the other hand, held hands and wept. As the judge pronounced the words guilty, cheers were heard through the crowd outside of the court. They were listening to audio of the sentence through a radio. The verdict was celebrated with a chorus of calls for justice by the crowd. Some protesters even set off fireworks. They were just so happy that little Isabella got justice. In the years since the trial, Anna Oliveira, Isabella's mother, got married and in 2016 gave birth to a little boy named Miguel. In February 2020, she gave birth to a little girl named Maria Fernanda. Although completely shattered by the tragic death of the, her first daughter, she managed to garner enough strength to put the pieces together and rebuild her life. Although a very reserved and discreet woman, she is very dear to the Brazilian people. On April 18th, 2020, the day that Isabella would have turned 18, her mother paid an emotional tribute to her on social media. Quote, Today your dreamed 18 years would come. The only question I have and will always have, how could that be? This question will remain silent. But today I know that the sky is celebrating and I know and believe that everything is fine. I know your evolution hasn't been interrupted and I feel that your growth is even greater. We have been separated for 12 years here on this earth, but 18 years united in one heart. As this union will forever and ever, so be it. I love you beyond what you can imagine, my internal little one. This completes the 19th episode of A Crime Story. Now, what do you think of this case? It is truly everyone's co-parenting nightmare and my heart breaks for little Isabella and her mother. Do you understand why this crime is so popular in Brazil and how it honestly shaped crime culture in Brazil? Do you think that the right people are in jail? You can comment on a crime story Instagram at a crime story pod where I will be posting images from today's story. You can comment on a crime story podcast on Facebook or a crime story pod on Twitter or even comment and see additional photos on a crime story podcast on YouTube. I am also on TikTok under the name A Crime Story Podcast. My website is a crimestorypodcast.com where you can listen to the podcast as well as read a transcript of today's story underneath the blog tab. I've recently included a map of the different cases covered on this podcast on the website underneath the episode slash case guide tab, so make sure to check it out. Thank you so much for listening. If you could please leave a review of the podcast on whatever medium you listen to, it helps others find the show. 
Also, if you could tell a friend about a crime story, I would greatly appreciate it. I hope to see you for the next episode, which will be released on December 2nd, 2020, where I will be covering a case from France. You won't want to miss it. A Crime Story is hosted, edited, and created by me, Kaylin Lois. This episode for A Crime Story podcast was written by me and Alini. Again, thank you so much, Alini, for all your help and research. Sources for today's episode can be found on my website, acrimestorypodcast.com. The artwork for the show was created by Sabrina Smith. Theme music is by Ross Budgen. Additional story editing is brought to you by my father, Mike. Thank you so much for listening to A Crime Story. Stay safe at home and abroad. Thank you.